Hey up everyone, something a little different today. This follows on from my sarcastic dig at Triumph's marketing department in the video linked at the end, and I hope it makes you smile, and maybe question some of the things we are told. KTM and Ducati have had some stick in the past too. To be clear though, I do see this as an industry-wide problem. The proliferation of fake bike news isn't helping either. If you believed half the auto-generated content being pushed on here, you would think that we had a V-twin XT1000 air-cooled trail bike built from the blocks of two Yamaha XT500 singles coming into dealers tomorrow. Today, I'm going to look at the news the big shillers and the industry in general would rather not talk about. Or you could say an alternative angle on the things the general media are saying. It is all said tongue-in-cheek, and says more about the industry in general than about any particular bike or manufacturer. Try not to forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel too if you enjoy it. Join the best motorcycle community on YouTube, and you won't regret it. You can find the best biker t-shirts in the shop on the website too, and it helps support the channel. The comments are always a great read, and they show you that we can respectfully disagree. Without a doubt, if we could amass the combined knowledge of all the subscribers, we would have the most complete motorcycle encyclopedia ever. Remember, please don't use the YouTube giving button, as they take most of it, and they've got plenty already. There is a link for donations in the description if you want to buy me a coffee. Anyway, here we go with the alternative ADV bike news. First today, although we are promised the new Royal Enfield Himalayan 450 will be in showrooms this year finally, the much talked about Himalayan rally won't arrive here until 2027. Also, if you like the old Himalayan, the new 450 Himalayan might not be as good for you as the old one was. The old one had bags of low down torque, which made easy work of all but the gnarliest green lanes in the hands of an even semi-competent rider. It might not be a bike to win the Dakar, but it was hard to stall and made for a relaxing ride. The new bike has a much revier engine, and the power is made higher up the rev range, which means that the rider needs to choose the right gear much more than they would with the original longer stroke gear called Himalayan motor. You will need to rev the engine to get the most from it, and when you do, you start to feel a tingle that was always missing with the original. The new bike is better than the old Himalayan in many ways, but just make sure they are the actual ways that you want. The new ride by Y throttle, rather than being crisp and snatchy, is laggy and slow to respond. There is a big dead zone before the throttle picks up, and it makes snappy acceleration difficult. On a highway passing a truck, that isn't great, but lifting the front wheel over rocks on a green lane is hard too. Then, we have some problems with the dash readings, or possibly more. There is a random error message that tells you to turn off the ignition and restart. Then we get the front wheel speed sensor fail message, which again requires a restart. These two messages aren't such an issue, and are reset by the ignition switch. But one that is more concerning is the message that tells you that the bike is overheating and to stop immediately. Obviously this isn't something you ever want to see. Reportedly it can be fans running slow, low coolant levels from the factory and problems with the sensors. But when all these problems mean a trip back to the dealer that isn't good at all. Battery charge level sensor failure is another problem that's come up. The bike tells you that the battery charge level is low and you should stop and charge it. But if the bike is running, it should always be charging. That problem seems associated with irregular use, but shows earth leakage somewhere in the electronic circuit. This is the first time Royal Enfield have built a bike with such a complex interface with electronic controls. So I guess there would always be bugs. However, these should have been ironed out, because they did have a long development time with this bike. Next, we come to the CF Moto 450 MT, which now seems to have been given the name the Ibex in some markets. 
The 450 twin-cylinder CF Moto 450 MT has promised lots and has been called the unicorn ADV bike we've all wanted for years. However, it's almost as heavy as the Yamaha T7 and by my calculations, heavier than the more powerful and better equipped Aprilia Touareg. Yes, at close to 200 kilos wet, the CF Moto 450 MT is much heavier than it should be. Its dry weight of 175 kilos keeps getting shouted from the rafters like it's the most amazing thing ever that a 450cc twin-cylinder ADV bike only weighs 175 kilos dry. It isn't. That ruins the whole package for me, and I see no reason why it weighs so much. At 175 kilos dry, with 17.5 litres of fuel alone, its wet weight would be around 195 kilos. Add oil, coolant and other fluids, and it is yet another 200 kilo ADV bike. So what is the point, really? Yes, it would be cheaper and more economical, but it could have been even more economical if it weighed less. After all, it was over 10 years ago now the CCM managed to build a 450 ADV bike that produced over 40 horsepower and 40 newton meters of torque and weighed just 125 kilos dry. Even with its 20 litre tank full to the brim, it weighed less than 150 kilos. Progress, eh? Next, I have to mention Hero. We had the successful launch of the Hero X Pulse 200 this year but no one outside India seems to care. We have a Maverick 440 launching soon, with the promise of an X-Pulse 440 to come, and they also won the contract to build the new 440cc Harley Davidson. Add to that, we got an amazing second place overall in Dakar, but heroes still don't seem interested in selling bikes to Europe and the USA. Despite their success in Dakar, they still seem content to focus primarily on the home market. What we are seeing is a whole line of new high-end hero dealerships being set up, just to focus on providing a more complete ownership experience for their premium products. They have at least two fantastic 450cc single engines, the race engine and the engine used in the Harley 440. They can build great chassis too. In addition, they have the ability to build great quality, smaller capacity bikes in huge quantities. These are the bikes that dominate the Indian market. But so far, Hero seem completely disinterested in entering the European, American or Australian markets. I, for one, would love to see an X-Pulse 450 launched in the UK. Next, we have another story about yet another Indian manufacturer. Bajaj Group are now one of the biggest motorcycle companies in the world, but you may never have heard of them outside of the Triumph deal, unless you live in India, that is. I talked about them in this video about KTM linked above. As well as the bikes they sell under their own banner, they manufacture for Triumph and KTM in India, and they have a controlling stake on the board of the Piero Mobility Group, which owns KTM, Husqvarna, Gas Gas and more. That is all before they start eating into the shareholdings at Triumph and MV Augusta too. They are very shrewd businessmen. They sacrificed their shareholding in the KTM group to take a majority shareholding in the parent company and show no signs of slowing down their drive to increase the corporate influence on the world stage. For now, they seem to prefer to stay in the shadows, pulling the strings. But ask yourself, Will that always be the case? Next, we have a story about an adventure bike that isn't new, doesn't make 100 horsepower, and doesn't pretend it can win the Dakar. However, the Riehu Adventurer is the ADV bike with the longest tank range of any ADV bike available, and it's significantly lighter than the CB500X2. You may remember me mentioning the Riehu team in this year's Dakar. Yes, Riehu a small Spanish manufacturer who mainly focus on dirt bikes have built a 500cc, 50 horsepower, twin-cylinder ADV bike 
with a 1,000 mile tank range. Well, actually, it's another bike built in China, but listen on. Imagine an old F650 GS single with an underseat tank, but then add a full size tank in the normal position. Put a CB500X engine in it, trim off as much weight as possible, and give it some fully adjustable, relatively long travel suspension. You will start to see that the 500 Aventura really is a great little adventure bike with a big attitude. I honestly can see no reason why this bike isn't seen far more often out on the roads, and I would love to see Riehu have more success in the future than they have had so far. In comparison, I would say this bike is streets ahead of the CF Moto 450 MT, but it is getting ignored completely by the press. I wonder why. Next, we come to the big boys. BMW decided to confuse me this year. It doesn't take much, to be fair. The all-new BMW 1300GS is actually heavier than its predecessor. Made predominantly from parts in stock, and has been described as of very poor quality compared to the previous 1250 model. Now I went into this in detail in the Eichmer video linked above, but putting it simply, add on all the extras that you get as standard on the 1250GS, and the 1300GS is heavier than its older sibling. There have been loads of complaints about paint quality, and old parts been stuck being used throughout the design, with a pile of bits you actually want taken off it. You don't even get a pillion seat. However, the smaller capacity F900GS, with the same engine as last year's 850, is actually lighter. Not just by a bit either. It is a whole 15 kilos lighter. And they didn't save weight by just leaving bits off like they did on the 1300GS. Yet very few people seem to be talking about the F900GS at all. The latest Lantine built an 900 twin still has much in common with the original Rotax design. However, it has been said that this new model only contains 20% of the original parts. It has an engine that has stood the test of time, and maybe this is the first sign that the bigger, more established players are finally going to give us something that weighs less than a tank. I wonder why BMW would spend the money on development saving weight on the 900, but then just get lazy with their top of the range or new R1300GS that has higher margins. I will leave you to ponder that one. The next bike may be part of the reason though. We got what has to be some more good news for a change. Motec Revolutions explains more in his video linked in the description, but Vosges have basically made a half-price BMW F900GS. Yes, Vosges as the luxury mark of the Lonsin brand, who built the BMW F900GS for BMW, are now building their own version. There are differences, but not many, and with BMW suffering so many recalls in recent years, you might actually get a more reliable bike if you buy the Vosges instead. Talking of BMW recalls, sort of, there have been announcements regarding the fabled driveshaft issues on the 1200 and 1250GS. Basically, in short, regardless of service history, there is a recall mod that's being done to the driveshaft of any bikes from a certain period, and a free driveshaft swap at around 50,000 miles. Even if you bought the bike second hand off John down the road, they will supply and fit a new shaft. Now, that is something that I think a few other manufacturers should take note of. Next, we have another one of the big hitters. The Ducati Desert X Rally has been featured on so many channels recently, I'm sick of seeing it. Ducati must have spent a fortune on that lawn. What they brush over very quickly is that it's actually heavier than the standard model. Now, on one level, I do like a lot about the Ducati Desert X, but come on Ducati, why is the Desert X Rally so heavy? Let us think about the term Rally, you think lighter, longer range tank, better suspension, 
More power? Extra protection? Well, I guess they ticked the better suspension box. But it reminds me of my old school reports. They always said, should do better. It also has to hold the title for the crappiest front mudguard ever made. You can see it in the footage here. It looks softer than the mudguards on the average AliExpress pit bike. So I've got no idea what it will flop around like at 100 mile an hour. Surely, the Multistrada serves those who want a bigger, heavier bike. Or call it a Desert X trampoline or something. If you're going to call it a rally model, the very least it should be in my eyes is lighter, not heavier. I don't understand why a company with such a sporting heritage and profile wouldn't make a rally version lighter than the standard Desert X. The old Desert Sled, with a bigger tank and better suspension, would have been significantly lighter and cost nothing in R&D. I honestly just don't understand why the Desert X rally has to be so heavy. Now, we have some sad news about an old favourite. The new Yamaha Tenere 700 has obviously reached that midlife point where things start to get a little muddled up. It has become just as complicated and overweight as the multitude of other big ADV bikes on the market. Because Yamaha don't have a bigger engine model, they seem to have just decided to make the T7 bigger and heavier. It just makes it seem like they didn't realise at all why their T7 sold so well. The T7 was simple, relatively cheap and lighter than the opposition. Instead of trying to improve on that concept more, they just made it more complicated, more expensive and heavier. What an incredible piece of customer research it must have been to send them down that path. Now, we get not one, but several bigger, more complicated versions, so the new bikes have become just like all the rest of the overweight hippos on the market. They still haven't made a decent seat for it either. Next, we have some non-news for many of us. The Kove 800X Super Adventure still isn't here in any of the Western markets. We've been promised a lot with this bike, and although available in the home market, it is sadly still missing across most of the world. Kobe Spain assure us it will be here this year, but my sources say they're still working on homologation for the European, American and Australian and Canadian markets, and there is no date fixed yet. As you can see on his channel linked above, Dave from Bullpen Cycles got fed up with waiting and has imported a Kobe 450 rally himself into Canada. So it may be that people start taking things into their own hands soon. That will be easier with off-road bikes though. I can imagine the pile of paperwork here to get an 800X on the road. Next, we have a cross-continental joint venture. The new Bajaj built Triumphs have been shielded beyond oblivion. The Triumph 400 Scrambler, just like the Speed 400, doesn't live up to its name very well. It isn't a Scrambler. It's got a plastic bash plate with a very vulnerable coolant reservoir directly behind that plastic bash plate, and it also has a low-level exhaust, and the ride-by-wire throttle is snatchy at slow speeds. Just what you need in a scrambler. The engine has no torque down low, and it's gutless unless you wring its neck. Wring its neck, and you'll feel the vibrations through every bone in your body. Even having your knees touching the tank gets intolerable over 70 mile an hour. Vibration at higher revs is unbearable. To call it buzzy is like calling a Hayabusa fast. It might be true, but it doesn't tell the full story. A wooden front brake grabs at low speed and fades with fast riding. It has hand guards that fall off in a light breeze and an engine that cuts out randomly for no apparent reason. That bit isn't being acknowledged or even discussed by Triumph either. Owners all over India have reported the problem. The bike cuts out and won't restart. Then randomly after a while it will start again. Yet Triumph are ignoring it. 
Come to think of it, they used to happen with an old trophy I had when the TPS sensor needed adjusting. I wonder, is it just poor quality control? To be honest, Triumph don't care. As long as it gets them a small share of the huge Indian market, they would sell their own grandmother. To finish off today, there are at least five new ADB bikes from China that look great, but we may never see any of them. As well as the inevitable KTM 790 variations, there is the big 1200cc Marini B-Twin and a longer stroke B-Twin 1000cc ADB bike from the Keyway Group. Then the Vosge 900 I talked about, which we should get, and there is the Zonte 700 Triple. This is probably the most different looking ADB bike I've seen teased for 2024, and maybe the most exciting looking prospect too. Who knows what will come next? I think Ducati still hold the title for the biggest, most complicated, overpowerful and expensive adventure bike for 2024 so far though. Anyway, that's it for today. Thanks for watching, and thanks again for the donations. I have left the donations link in the description, and all donations are much appreciated. It does help keep the channel free from sponsored posts. Because I don't think you need yet another channel trying to sell you more rubbish you don't really need. Just go and get a free VPN, or grow a beard. As I've said, please don't use the YouTube giving button, as they take most of it. Why not take a look around the website? You get the best biker t-shirts in the shop and it helps support the channel too. The blogs have loads of articles about all sorts, from maintenance tricks to stories from ride outs, track days and other adventures. There are even more printed products on the Redbubble page too, from mugs and hats to wall art, socks, sweatshirts and phone cases. Basically, if you can print on it, I can usually supply it somehow. So just drop me a line by the contact page on the website. I try and put promo codes in the community page for discounts when I can too. So it's always worth checking in case there's a big discount on. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel if you got this far. We really do have the best motorcycle community on YouTube. And I have you to thank for that. Remember, keep your spanners close and your keys even closer. Ride free everyone.